everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Now You Know. And today we have a great interview, I think, planned for uh, Kathy Hanoon, who is the president and co-founder of Dandelion. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me today. All right, so what do you guys do at Dandelion? At Dandelion, we install geothermal heat pumps in homes. So these are systems that let homeowners switch to renewable heating and cooling. Okay, so is this sort of like... Uh, like a power source. Like I've heard that Iceland is like all geothermal. So it's it's like a power plant in your house. Okay, so you drill down into the magma of the earth. Is that how it works? You know, fortunately, no. But that is a very common misconception. What we do is we actually are just using the earth as a source of heat, as a big thermal mass. Whereas in Iceland, they're using, as you said, like magma deep under the earth. We're going much shallower and basically just using stored heat from the sun. Okay, so I'm a little confused here because when I dig ditches, which I've been known to do, uh, down there, you know, a few feet underground, it's like 50, 55 degrees or something. And that's pretty much always the temperature it is. But how do I get 55 degrees to heat my house? I, that doesn't make any right, sense. Right, my house is warmer than that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the difference between temperature and heat is a good one to understand. So even though the ground is, as you said, around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we're able to collect that heat and then concentrate it and boost the temperature using a compressor. So the 55 degree heat, if you will, is brought into your heat pump. That heat pump runs a vapor compression refrigeration cycle and that uses electricity to take that 55 degrees to something more like 120 degrees. And that's distributed through your home using ductwork like your normal heating system would do. Interesting. So what I've heard about geothermal over the years is that um, it's a complicated thing, right? Because you got multiple contractors. First, you got a well guy and he's going to show up and he's going to make a mess of your lawn because he's going to bring this giant truck that's like, you know, 40 feet tall and he's just going to spew mud all over the place. Uh, so... How did you guys solve that problem? The issue you talked about, about multiple contractors, that definitely has been a major issue in the industry. As you said, you need a driller and then you also need someone to actually put the heat pump in, not to mention maybe like an engineer to design the whole system, maybe a general contractor to coordinate everything. And so, you know, that's been an obstacle to say the least. Um, not many homeowners want to take that sort of project on just to replace their heating system. So one of the big things that Dandelion exists to do is to just to dramatically simplify the process so that you can just sign up and then for an affordable price, one company will just like handle everything and you don't have to be, become a construction manager in your spare time. Um, to your point about drilling, yeah, I think that in rural areas where you have a lot of land, it might be fine to have a well drill come in and do the installation because you have a ton of land and like you don't really care. However, a lot of our homeowners live in Westchester in these like fairly dense, very manicured lawns communities. And your neighbor might have an objection, if, even if you don't, <laughs> to like bring a giant well in. So, um, you know, and not to mention, sometimes it's not even possible, right? Like these homes are right next to each other and you don't even have space. So one of the things we've done at Dandelion is we've developed a rig um, and really just a whole drilling suite of equipment because you need more than just the rig to put the loops in um, that's designed for residential. So it's designed for that Westchester community where you're really trying to fit into tight spaces and not leave a huge mess. I thought it was really interesting that with a typical well, you're drilling down and you have to put casing, you know, basically big pipe into the ground. And so it gets more and more expensive the deeper you go. Um, but you guys have come up with a system where you don't have to leave the casing in the ground. Can you explain how you guys figured that out? Yeah. So the, the type of drill that we use, it's called a sonic drilling rig. And sonic um, is a technology that vibrates the casing as it's going down. So it's actually it's almost magical seeming when you watch it because it's vibrating at a frequency that's specifically designed to cause liquefaction to happen locally um, where that casing is touching. So that means like the soil starts to act like a liquid and that casing, even though it's a solid metal, just looks like it's slipping into the ground as if it's like 
you know, hot knife through butter type of thing. So not only does that let you go really quickly, but it's also fairly clean. And then the advantage also is that at the end, when you put that loop in, you used your casing, you're ready to move on. You can again use that vibrating head at your drill rig to collect your casing to bring it out of the hole. Whereas for a conventional rig, since you're hammering the casing down, like sometimes hundreds of feet, once it's in there, you're not getting it back. And then the homeowner ends up having to pay for hundreds of feet worth of steel casing because essentially they're stuck with it forever. So, all right. So how does this work? So uh, you you are drilling a hole essentially, or you're, you're putting this casing down uh, deep into the earth. How, how deep are we going? We typically go about 300 to 500 feet deep. Um, so it's not nothing, but it's a lot less than you would go in Iceland. Um, <laughs> but you know, the way we figure out how deep to go is a function of how much heating and cooling does the house need. And part of our technology at Dandelion is software models that really allow us to be very precise because, um, you basically pay per amount you drill. So Financially, the homeowner is better off not to drill more than they need to. But of course, you need to drill as much as you, you don't want to shortcut it because that would be the worst case. Like you would not have enough heat, which would be really bad. So what typical contractors have done in the past is they just use a very conservative rule of thumb. You want to make sure that you have more than enough hole so that there's no risk that you won't be warm in the winter. What we're able to do using lots of data about the subsurface that we have in our model is just give a more precise estimate that's still conservative in the sense that we have a safety um, margin for error, so you're not going to be cold in the winter, but we're able to drill a lot less, about 20% less than conventional, um, which ultimately saves the homeowner money. Interesting. So why do you have to dig so deep? I mean, if I can dig a hole in my backyard and the temperature of the earth there is going to be roughly 55 degrees, why don't I just bury a coil of, uh, of hose and call it a day and you know push all the dirt back in and all set? The reason for that is you can imagine if you have a small hole and you're trying to extract a, enough heat to heat a house, that hole will get colder and colder and colder as you're pulling all the heat out to make your house warm. But if you had a giant hole and you're extracting heat from a really large area, the temperature of that hole is not going to change nearly as quickly. And that's, that's because you're just pulling that heat from a much larger place. I guess it would be similar to, um, you know, boiling a small pot of water is much easier and faster than trying to boil a huge pot of water, right? Like we all have that experience and it's the same thing. It's like you add you add heat to a small thermal mass, it heats up more quickly than a large thermal mass. So um, because of that, we actually are looking at how much thermal conductivity, like what linear footage of thermal contact is between the well and the ground. That's just a fancy way of saying how big is that pot of water that you want for, in order to like heat your house adequately in the winter? So, I mean, we're extracting the heat from the earth. And if if we were to just put a big coil all on top of itself of hose and run stuff through that, it would extract some heat, but then you'd run out of heat because you, there wasn't enough area, like surface area for the, the ground to actually connect to it. And I'm assuming the ground isn't particularly like conductive, like it's it's a pretty insulative thing so the heat doesn't travel very quickly through it, right? I think that concept that you're bringing up, like the rate, the, the thermal conductivity of the ground, the rate at which more heat from the earth can replenish what you're taking away, that's the core idea exactly. It's like you need to make sure that you have enough surface area with the earth that the rate at which you're pulling heat from any one part of that loop is not too much more than the rate that the earth can naturally replenish it. Interesting. So can I ask a dumb question? Because I thought that geothermal had to do with getting down and hitting water and then using the water in the earth 
to loop through the system. But from what I've been hearing and learning about your system, you're putting in loops of pipe. Um, and so they're not touching like the aquifer. You're not wrong. There is a type of geothermal called open loop geothermal, and it does exactly what you're saying. It pulls water um, from an aquifer underground, puts it through your heat pump to extract the heat, and then puts it back into the aquifer. Um, that's not what we do. We have what's called a closed loop geothermal system. So we have a loop, a literal loop of um, plastic pipe that has water running through it. And it just, the same water circulates through the same pipe infinity times. <laughs> like, you That's know, the water get, picks up the heat or drops off the heat and the earth goes through the heat pump and, you know, ad infinitum. And the reason we've done that is because, you know, like, first of all, it's kind of nice to have your um, system isolated from the outdoor environment because you really decrease the risk of pollution or just contaminating or messing with aquifers, which is something we would not want to do. It also tends to be lower maintenance. Like it's less likely that a contaminant or, you know, debris or just things will get into your system. And then also like you could theoretically have a closed loop system in a place that did not have a, a water table um, that was accessible, which would not be possible with open loop. Yeah, because I was going to say, I think the stress for drilling a lot of times is that you want to hit water. And when you don't hit it, it's like, oh, we went down 300 feet. We didn't hit it. We got to keep going. And then, you know, as the homeowner, you're like, you're stuck. You have to keep going. And that's just money, money, money. Right. right. Yeah, because I've uh, we know of a system right here in our own town where it's the open loop system um, and it started affecting the aquifer. It started pulling basically contaminants from a from a site that was nearby towards this uh, bunch of homeowners. And so this one person whose system was operating uh, if he, he either had to shut down a system or they had to pipe in water to the to the town. So this is great to hear that your system is closed. It's not affecting the, the water table at all. That's right. That's a great example for why we strongly prefer and only do closed loop systems. All right. So whenever I'm drilling a hole, whether it be in wood or metal or stone or dirt, um, you have, you know, the sawdust, you have the, the stuff that comes out of the hole because you can't make a hole without taking the stuff out of the hole. So what happens to all the stuff that was in the hole? Yeah, I mean, we put it in a big pile and then somebody from Dandelion comes and collects it and disposes of it responsibly. So <laughs> it's um, pretty simple, but I would say like as simple as that sounds, uh, it is better than the conventional alternative, which is sort of like smearing it all over the yard leaving it in a pile on the yard, maybe letting it, you know, muddily spew in a giant plume. So like, we just try to be a little bit neat about it. You know, you're right. It's inevitable. You drill a hole, dirt comes out of the hole. You have to do something with it. We just try to be neat, collect it, dispose of it. So can we just uh, go into a little more depth about the spewing uh, and plume of of dirt and mud that would happen in a conventional uh, drilling scenario? What, uh, yeah, because I mean, it... I'm a contractor and most drilling guys that I've met just leave a big mess when they're done. Like it looks like the like the moonscape when right. they're done. And they're like, see you later. I gave you your hole, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that is reasonable in some cases, right? Like you're drilling a hole. Um, you're not necessarily a dirt collector, but at Dan Blaine, we're really looking at the problem more holistically and trying to provide a service that's exceptional for homeowners. And so, of course, that does make put us in the business of collecting dirt. Now, on the on the this old house video, I had seen that it looked like you guys were actually filtering some of the the mud uh, to to get at the water to reuse the water. Like, how does that work? Yeah. So there are different types of drilling. Um, what you're describing is called mud rotary drilling. And you need water to help stabilize the hole. You're using water instead of casing in that case. Um, and because you need so much water, it's really good to be able to reuse water. So you're not just like needing to use you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of fresh water. And so, yeah, we have a mud processor that does that for us, um, which is not atypical. Like that is not unique to us, but it is, uh, we've tried to design 
that mud processor within the context of our suite of equipment to be appropriate for residential. Now, I don't want to keep talking about drilling, but it's a, it's a big part of what you guys do. And the typical drillers are ginormous. They look like they couldn't fit onto a normal homeowner's lawn, but yours looks completely different. Can you describe some of the, the differences that yours has? Yeah, I think um, the problem of how do you drill a, a 300 to 500 foot hole or two at a home in a suburban environment, it's like not a well-explored problem. Because who needs to do that? You know, like you're probably on city water. You don't need a well. It's just like no one has really, no one has thought too deeply about, there's been no reason to really think about that problem. And so, um, you know, there's lots of opportunity to (laughs) to improve uh, the equipment and processes and just like methods for doing that. And one thing that becomes clear very quickly is like, you have narrow side yards and you have stone walls and you have slopes and you have like, I don't know, all manner of residential obstacles. And so it really helps to have modular equipment instead of one giant piece of equipment. Because with modular equipment, you have a lot, you can play a little Tetris game and figure out like, how do you arrange it in a way that's suitable for that individual unique home? which is something we do all the time. And and so that's really what it is. It's just like, what is the arrangement of equipment that's maximally efficient for dandelion? So we don't need too many people to drive it around. We don't need too many trucks, but also like really well suited to these tiny, variable residential environments. Yeah, I mean, some of the innovations I was really impressed with is that uh, you have rubber tire, uh, rubber uh, tracks on your well dr- diggers so that they can kind of not hurt lawns. And then instead of 20 foot long casings, which is kind of the standard, uh, because you have to picture this machine like rotates a thing up vertical and then, you know, now it's hitting trees and stuff. Yours is your casings are 10 feet long, which is uh, a huge difference in size. Yeah. And those I mean, those are all just decisions. It's kind of like when you're buying a car and there are so many options, like do you want a sunroof or no sunroof? And do you want leather seats or canvas? You know, I think um, a lot of our work on the drilling side is really making those types of selections with the equipment available in many different industries, geotechnical, surveying, environmental, well, water, Um, just seeing what's out there and like trying to Choose the pieces that will fit together in a way that's optimal for residential. All right. So we've got our hole uh, three to five hundred feet deep. We've got the loop of, of uh, plastic tubing in there. Um, now what? Now we have to install a heat pump. Usually that heat pump goes where the customer's furnace used to be. So typically in a basement, sometimes in a mechanical room or utility closet. And we connect the ground loop right underground through the usually through the foundation wall um to that heat pump okay so now we have a heat pump now aren't there heat pumps already that you can just leave outside like uh, air conditioning units and uh, mini splits and stuff like that i'm glad you brought that up because i think heat pump is a pretty unfamiliar term for most people whereas um in reality i think a lot of people are familiar with heat pumps. It's your refrigerator is a heat pump, your air conditioner, as you said, is the heat pump. Um, But the difference with geothermal or like the type of heat pump that geothermal is, is one that exchanges heat with the ground, whereas air conditioners exchange heat with the outside air, which is why you see, as you said, that, um, that part, that compressor right outside the home, typically exchanging that heat with the outside air. Okay, well, if we've got all this outside air and we didn't even have to drill for it, why don't we just heat exchange with the outside air? Yeah, it's a good question. And the major downside to the outside air is it tends to change temperature pretty drastically over the seasons. And not only does it change temperature over the seasons, but it changes temperature in the exact way that you're trying to work against when you're heating and cooling your home. So for example, when do you need heat the most? When it's the coldest outside? Well, that's going to be the day that it's the hardest to pull heat out of that very, very cold outside air. And similarly in the summer, 
when you're trying to reject heat from your house into the outside air, it's going to be the hardest to do that when it's like 100 degrees, which is when you need air conditioning. And that's really the benefit of connecting with the ground. It's always just 50 degrees. It's going to be pretty easy to take heat from that environment or put heat into that environment, regardless of the temperature outside. Right. So there's always a, uh, to get scientific here, there's always a delta T, a change in temperature between the earth and my house of about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, right? It's 50 to probably I want my house around 70. And whereas outside, you know, like we have this problem ourselves, we have some split um, mini, you know, pumps. And when it's zero degrees outside and we want it to be 70, we've got we've got a 70 degree temperature differential. Right. It, it would be great if when it was cold outside, we wanted to get our house even <laughs> colder. Right. Um, but you really don't want to do that. Let's get into the money here. Right. Because that's, I think, what's on everyone's mind right? right now. They're like, okay, guys, let's get to the money. What you just described sounds a lot to me like solar because we talk about this on the show all the time. Take the time to put the solar on your roof and then the sun just delivers the energy free for the rest of your life. Here, we're talking about the earth. Take the time to put in the, the well and the heat pump and then the earth gives you basically that heat forever. Yeah, I think it is very similar. And I, I think that's actually a common trait of many renewables where there's some sort of upfront infrastructure investment and then you tap into this free renewable energy source for a long time. So I totally agree with you. All right, but here's where I got you, right? Uh, the the cost of doing that well and putting in the heat pump is probably what's going to stop most homeowners, right? Because they're like, oh, that's thousands of dollars and I don't have that kind of money. So I'm going to go with something cheaper for now. Even though it's more expensive in the long run, I just don't have the money right now. So what what is, you have an answer to that, I think. We do. And we really learned from solar on this. Um, we offer financing and about half of our customers choose to finance their systems. And that allows them to actually pay nothing up front. And then the total cost of their system over time, so the cost of paying back that financing plus the cost to run their system is still less than what they used to be paying for fuel oil or propane or whatever they were using to heat their house. Whoa. Oh, because that's, you know, normally when you take out a loan on something like a car or a house, it's not making, it's not saving you that amount of money to pay for whatever it is. You're just paying for it. Right. So what you're saying is that by putting in a geothermal system, you'd actually be saving uh, so much money on heating and cooling your house that you would be paying less, even though you were also paying for the financing of the geothermal system? That's right. It's cash flow positive. So you're strictly better off to do this. Um, and that's not even taking into account the fact that at some point you would have had to replace that furnace anyway, right? Like there is an avoided cost in this case that you don't get in solar. And that just like adds to your savings as well. Interesting. Plus, we're not even talking about the benefits to the environment here. We're just talking about your pocketbook at the moment. But talk to me about what the benefits are if I have, let's say, um, a, a fuel oil system or a natural gas system. Yeah, well, fuel oil. So I would say probably about 70% of our customers are switching from fuel oil. And that's because fuel oil is very expensive, but also it's just like a huge hassle to use. You have to schedule a big truck to come and like fill up an oil tank in your basement and it's just kind of crazy we're still doing this in the 21st century but um but yeah i would say that the typical homeowner will save probably around one to two thousand dollars a year um versus fuel oil which is i mean very significant and think about the fact that these systems last for 20 25 years and even when the heat pump reaches end of life, the ground loop is going to last for pretty much the lifetime of the house. So you'll never have to undergo that part of the installation again. And replacing a heat pump, it's much more similar to replacing an air conditioner. You know, it's a heat pump. And when you put in these uh, outdoor air conditioner systems, I mean, because so most houses like in the Northeast, we've got to heat them and we got to cool them. And that's two Basic, separate separate systems. systems. I mean, right. you know, you combine the coil, but but yeah, it's two separate systems. Um, your system, I believe, is one system. Yeah, we just have one system. It actually does heating, cooling, and contributes to hot water in the home. So one reason that some of our homeowners adopt geothermal is because 
they don't like having all the equipment. It's like they don't like having the noisy sort of eyesore compressor outside their house. They want to just consolidate and have it be totally hidden, out of view, quiet, don't need to worry about it. And that's one advantage that geothermal offers. I think some of the myths going around about geothermal are because it's been around for so long and things have changed, but yet our, our myth stays in our head. One of the myths I've heard a lot of times from homeowners is that it uses a lot of electricity, so it's just going to cost more than my existing system. Well, really, the whole point of geothermal is that it shouldn't take a lot of electricity, right? Like that's the advantage of having that ground loop of the small delta T. So any geothermal that system that is using a lot of electricity, I would I would wonder, was it designed correctly? Is it installed correctly? Because really like it shouldn't be. Um, but I do think that the industry in the past, there has been sort of like a lack of um, standards. There is, it's a very small industry. There's not too much quality control. That's really starting to change. Like we're seeing a lot more attention from utilities, from local government, from state government. And it looks like quality is on the upswing, which is great news for the industry because these systems have so much to offer. It's too bad that that's their reputation. Right. And it's very similar to what solar had to go through. And it sounds like a very similar experience for people who wanted to install solar than that who also wanted to install geothermal. Because to install solar back in the day, you'd have to be the person to buy the panels yourself. You'd have to hire someone to install them who is a separate person who didn't have never used those panels before. You'd have to have an electrician to also install those panels correctly. And all if any of those one people messed it up, you would either have a leaky roof, a system that was dangerous, uh, some kind of other problem. And on top of that, it was really expensive. And so if we're thinking about it in terms of geothermal, where again, you were saying like being a project manager for this, like uh, like a building job, uh, you'd have to hire the driller separately. You'd have to hire the person who's going to install the heat pump separately. But you're taking care of all of that together and you're able to do it with a, you know, someone, an engineer who can design the system, all of that all together takes the hassle right away and the quality goes up. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. And I do think geothermal is where solar was in the early days. You know, I, um, I guess as one example, similar to what you just mentioned, you used to have to have a professional engineer design the solar panel layout for a given house. Now there are a dozen companies that all they do is automate the design of the solar panels on the house, given the pitch of the roof and the angle and like any shading and they do it all from a satellite image. And it's amazing. You know, it's like mm -hmm. there's so much innovation and it's just made the process very foolproof and very cheap. Um, and that's the journey we're on as well. It's like, how can we bring that, not just to the electricity side of the house, which is what solar is doing, but to the heating side. Because I think what a lot of people are just like, including myself before Dandelion, I didn't think that often about how 70% of a typical home's energy usage is thermal energy. So like for a typical home in New York, even if they put solar on their roof and it satisfies 100% of their electricity load, most of their energy is actually going towards keeping that house warm in the winter. And that's not usually done with electricity. So geothermal is kind of this missing piece to have a fully renewable house. Okay, so you're replacing the furnace and you're also replacing your air conditioner unit outside, all with this one heat pump. So how does that work? So if I have an air conditioning system already and I already have a furnace, those things get taken away and then just hooked up like the air conditioning it just kind of works yeah so the furnace um will be connected to ductwork let's say that distributes heat throughout your house and we replace that furnace with a heat pump and that heat pump can produce warm air by taking heat out of the ground or it can produce cold air by taking heat from your house and putting it into the ground and so that heat pump is either going to be circulating heat or cool air through that ductwork See, this is the missing missing piece because the reason I got solar on my house was to make my electricity renewable, green, you know, carbon neutral. 
But yeah, I'm still heating my house with natural gas and it makes me mad because I'm not carbon neutral. I need this missing piece. So right. where are you located? Can I get it now? Well, today we're located only in New York. We've got to move. <laughs> We've got to move to New York. <laughs> but soon we'll be expanding into Connecticut and then hopefully throughout the Northeast beyond that. That's us. That's us. Nice. Awesome. So, okay. So how many houses have you worked on so far? We have, we're almost to around 500 houses at this point. And I would say like one thing that's been so rewarding and fun for me as one of the founders is we installed maybe about 20 houses in our first year. And then in our second year it was like four to five times that many and now it's just our third year and we're already on track to do four to five times more so um it's just been this really amazing growth that even despite covid is continuing um even though we're really only available in a small market or well, a small number of markets today and one thing that's really rewarding to me about that is just at the very beginning, my co-founder James and I, we thought that homeowners would love this because it seemed like a great product to us and we knew we would love it, but you never know, right? Like you never know if that's actually going to be accepted in the market until you try. And so just to see that so many normal homeowners are rapidly adopting geothermal, it's, um, it just gives me so much hope for our ability to offset this huge sector of emissions. So I want to kind of get into, uh, not to be a downer, but this new normal that we're going into uh, in the world um, with COVID and people working from home. Normally, you'd go off to work, the house would be empty, the kids would be in school, doesn't matter what temperature it is inside the house. And so a lot of people had been uh, adopting you know, scheduled timers and stuff to, you know, turn off the heating and cooling when, while you were away. And that was great. You're saving uh, basically heating and cooling in your house. But now with people working at home, they need to keep their houses always on. And so a lot of people have noticed that their utility bills have gone up because they've needed to heat their homes more and needed to cool their homes more. And a system like this is going to make even more sense the longer your heating system or cooling system is turned on. That's right. Yeah, it's really like the more you use it, the more your savings will accrue. Um, I would say that the work from home movement has also just really increased the need that people feel for central air conditioning. Because I think historically in New England and even in the mid-Atlantic, like New York where we're based, not everyone has central air conditioning. It's actually like not even that common. And so, you know, that used to be fine, but I think we're entering a time when it's no longer fine for most people. Um, so some people really approach geothermal at the same time. They're just going to switch their house over to have central air conditioning because they can't stand to go without it any longer. So getting back to cost for a second, um, if a homeowner is looking at this right now and like, this looks really interesting. I heard that maybe I could just finance this and have zero upfront costs, but I'd kind of like to know what it would cost to just install in my house if I want to buy the system, because it sounds like about half of your homeowners do that. What is the typical, you know, if you take the average American house or the average house in New York, what is the typical system going to cost? It will cost just under $20,000. And that's after um, incentives. So one thing that's really nice about geothermal right now is there's both state and federal incentives in a lot of places. So I can speak most specifically about New York since that's where we're based, but we have the whole country enjoys a 26% federal tax credit at the moment. So um, that's great. And then um, in addition to that, in New York, all the utilities have incentives on top of that. So those incentives tend to be anywhere from around like five or $6,000 to all the way up to over $10,000, just depending on which utility and how big your system is. So there's just a lot of support financially for homeowners to make this change. So a lot of our viewers watching now, I think, and me included, are surprised that you guys are a startup, like you are just started three years ago. Um, are you guys ever thinking of getting to the stage of IPOing? Because I mean, a lot of our viewers watching are probably like, how can I get in on this? 
Yeah, I would love, it It would be a dream for me as a founder to take this company public someday. Awesome. And it sounds like you're growing so fast. Are you looking for new employees? We are. We're always looking for new employees, Um, you know, really across the board at the company, anything from business development and sales to um, people who know how to install HVAC systems, people who know how to drill, you know, we're hiring drillers. Um, we're hiring people who know who have CDL licenses. So it's like this huge diversity of roles that we're hiring for. Well, it was so great to meet you today, Kathy. Thank you so much for telling us about Dandelion and dispelling a lot of the myths about geothermal. And uh, I hope that if you're watching right now and you're interested, that you'll go check them out. So if people are watching and want to know how to find out about you, where should they go? Dandelionenergy.com. Nice. And we'll put that link down in the description below so you don't have to type it out. (laughs) Just a click away. Save you some energy. (laughs) Thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Thanks so much for watching Now You Know. We work hard to bring you videos about things that we think you'll find useful, but we need to know from you what you want to see. So leave your comments below. Also, don't forget to go over to our Patreon page where for as little as a buck a month, you can watch our Patreon bonus story every week on Tesla Time News. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.